Well, Merry Christmas, everybody. Good to see you all up and uh, out already so early today after that show last night. Uh, I think everybody enjoyed that. But who was the big guy in the, in the funny red suit? I, <laughs> no, that was wonderful. And it's great to be out here on the high seas and the warm air and far away from the traffic and all of the weather back some places. And, uh, and so it reminds me of a story about a... <clears throat> A, a elderly couple who tried to book a cruise, but it was overbooked, and so they were suddenly at home. Meanwhile, the, their, their kids and all the grandkids were all over the different places, and they said, well, what are we going to do? And so uh, the, the grandfather says, well, dear, I think I have an idea. He picks up the phone, calls his daughter, said, I've had enough. Christmas Day, I'm leaving your mother, and I'm getting, we're going to get a divorce, and, and we just can't stand being alone together anymore. And, and she said, what, what? And says, well, here, ask her. She gives her the phone to the mother and says, yes, that's true. I want this oaf out of my house, etc." And they say, oh, and then the daughter says, oh, I have to call the brother. I have to call the other sister. And they call back in a few minutes. Oh, we'll all be there. We'll bring the kids. We, we can't let this happen. All right, well, we'll try. We'll wait one more day. They hang up the phone and said, well, dear, that worked this time. They're paying their own way, but we better not try that next Christmas. <laughs> anyway, so here we are. <laughs> And uh, as, a, as a sailor and a mariner, I have spent many a Christmas at sea, and uh, depending on where you are, it can be a wonderful event, and of course we have nice seas, and we had a good visit in uh, Port Elizabeth yesterday. I wonder what the elephants do on Christmas Day, other than take a mud bath yet again. But uh, today I'm going to talk about the Southern Ocean, which is where we are. Now, most people don't even know what that means other than they think it's the uh, southern side of the Caribbean or the southern side of somewhere else, but it's actually the world ocean that goes around all the, the capes of the southern hemisphere and then surrounds Antarctica. And so this is a term that is used by oceanographers to refer to the, the southern part of what is now called the world ocean. And uh, of course, as a <coughs> Melville said, all, all of our continents are mere islands to the great ocean. And so here we have a not completely accurate view, but of course we're off of South, uh, South Africa, but then you have this great swirling of the sea all around Antarctica. And this is a very dynamic part of the world because there are some of the most tremendous ocean currents down where we are right now. And there is a current that goes um, all around the world it's driven, though, by the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic, and it takes Arctic water that f drops into the depth of the Atlantic Ocean and then comes all the way down to where we are in the Southern Ocean and continues around the world and circulates up to the North uh, Pacific and comes back as a warm current on the surface through um, Indonesia, the Indian Ocean, and then back into the Atlantic. Now, this is sort of a... Ma a a mega phenomena that was not really understood because sailors and oceanographers have been out there for hundreds of years or decades studying it and they didn't really realize that the earth has this global current pattern which is essential to the stability of the climate especially and then the exchange of heat and nutrients throughout the ocean. So where we are, we are coming down we, those of us who are on the ship coming all the way down the west coast of Africa, we came into the Bengula current, the coal current that goes up the west coast of Africa. And now we're right off the tip where we're meeting the Agulhas current, which is a warm Indian Ocean current coming down by Mozambique. And then there's this great Antarctic circumpolar current that is sweeping around the world without any land in, to impede its constant flow. And that is flowing between two and five knots at all times around Antarctica. Then there's some, once you get down below the polar circles and the, uh, right near the Antarctic landmass, you have these, uh, uh, let's say, massive eddies that go the other way. So the, the, the circumpolar current is heading from west to east constantly, as are the winds. Now, where we, just where we are, we have a bit of the continental shelf of Africa and Cape Town's off to the left, and we're he coming up this uh, long and somewhat of a flat coast. It's not very dramatic. But our, of course, our next port in Durban is the third largest city of South Africa. But we've already passed these different capes. Um, we sail out of Cape Town, Cape of Good Hope, 
then Danger Point, and finally Cape Agulhas, and now we're actually off this map right now. This was very difficult uh, for the original explorers. Of course, the, the African natives came by land. They did not have boats to go around here. And so when the Portuguese finally came down to Cape Town and Mosul Bay, um, they were, first of all, greatly impressed by this land, of course. They were trying to get to India, though. And others had sailed around. Perhaps the Phoenicians came around. Perhaps others have sailed around here, the Chinese, for instance, before the Portuguese. Uh, but when they came in to these points, they would put up uh, a cross and a claim for Portugal, but they continued on, didn't make the settlements of South Africa that was left of the Dutch and the English, finally. But they, they encountered the rough seas and the contrary currents, especially right off uh, Cape Town, Cape Good Hope, Cape Agulhas, that was originally called by Diaz the uh, uh, Cape of Storms, because he came at a time of the year in the, uh, the late uh, fall when it becomes very rough down here. When, you may know the story, went back up to Portugal and the King uh, Zhao said, no, well, let's give hope, we'll call it the Cape of Good Hope because we hope we can get around it. And of course, Vasco da Gama finally did. When you come down here, you also see uh, all of the stars are different. I don't know if you've been out on deck, uh, particularly aft where you, or I'm sorry, forward of the observation lounge where you, it's dark enough so you can actually see the stars. And uh, the Southern Cross is now standing aside in the early evening to the southeast. But when by three or three to four in the morning now, it'll stand up and be the, the four stars and the fifth in the center of it will be pointing due south. Now when Americo Vespucci first came down to the coast of South America, he considered this a sign from God that Christians were supposed to go and discover the southern hemisphere. And that in those days, as a navigator, you needed a star uh, celestial navigation. So they were completely confounded what all these new stars meant for navigation. There was no North Star. The only southern indicator is the, uh, the Southern Cross, which we can see tonight if it's uh, not cloudy. They also thought there was land down here, just as um, some of the medieval maps showed there was a uh, uh, t terra astral, which means there must be land further to balance out the harmony of the planet, let's say. Here's an earlier Portuguese description of it. Now that's South Africa there. And they thought that there must be another continent nearby which is magically depicted as full of forests and natives and things like that. It wasn't quite that way, but this is the great passage between South Africa and now what we know as Antarctica. And in the exploration of the world, they had sightings of, first of all, the ice, and then they imagined that this must be coming from a bigger land. So here's a 1567 map made in Holland, which shows a vast Antarctic continent, uh, even coming up and abutting South America, because the uh, Drake Passage was not on the charts yet. So this is not quite what it was, but it impelled people to go down to the Southern Ocean and keep going further south to see what they could find. So Edmund Halley, the great English uh, scientist, sent his ships to study magnetic variations and to test the limits of the oceans. Uh, and so he knew that there was this ocean down here, but on his chart he did not put land there because they had not found any identifiable land down here. And when you get down in here in certain conditions, you have either terribly rough weather or else you have a flat calm like we have today uh, pretty much, it's not th not that uh, rough. And when we left Cape Town, we had absolutely still seas for the f first part of our day out, let's say, from Cape Town. And so you get uh, illusions in the ocean. It, it happens in tropical waters too, but this is called Fata Morgana, or reflections from the the glassy sea into the cloud cover, or other phenomena I hear that uh, were the legends of sailors. Now, this is an actual optical illusion you can get. You can see land, or you can see a a ship upside down in the sky and things like that. And sailors being superstitious, they uh, believed that there were ships that were out sailing out there forever. Most famously, the Flying Dutchman, which was a Dutch vessel that was doomed to forever sail. And its course is around the Southern Ocean. And it has been sighted off of South Africa. Uh, most famously by a young midshipman on a Royal Navy ship back about 1905 
who happened to be become George V. So it must be true. So keep an eye out there. You might find the Flying Dutchman somewhere on our course as we go around the, the capes here. Uh, this is the course of the clipper ships, though. And <clears throat> so when you left Europe and you come down to get to Australia, you come down through the Atlantic, and then you take the, the westerlies, the roaring 40s, blowing over, uh, all the way, taking you around the Cape of um, Agulhas and then to Cape Lewin in Australia and then all the way around Cape Horn. Uh, but they used to say that uh, below the 40s there was no rescue, below the 50s there was no hope, and below that there was uh, no, no chance at all. So how many ships would come down here and just disappear, especially if they got down past what's called the Antarctic Convergence where suddenly the water is very cold and the, everything ices up, so ships that were sailing would sometimes get lost in in the ice and then they would run out of supplies. They'd still be sailing just like the Flying Dutchman, but everybody would perish on board, especially as they try to get around Cape Horn, which is another 20 degrees further south from where we are, and much colder, much rougher. So, but here we are. I got Cape uh, Agulhas, which is the most southern tip of Africa, and where the Indian Ocean and the uh, Atlantic Ocean meet, but what they really are is the convergence of currents into the Southern Ocean. Uh, but they're characterized by these currents and winds colliding. So you have the Southern Ocean uh, transpolar current, which is coming from west to east, and then you have the Agulhas uh, current coming from the Indian Ocean, and it creates a great deal of chop. And this is the area where, in, particularly in the Austral winter time, that means um, uh, July, August into September down here, the, the water gets very, very rough. And this is one of the most dangerous passages for large ships. This is a temperature chart. You can see the hot water coming down into the, hitting the cold water that's below the convergence. And so that creates very uh, turbulent seas and a lot of upwelling and cross currents. And famously, ships will, sail ships in particular would have a hard time making way against this current, and then they would go further south, and then they would be in even rougher water. So sailors for hundreds of years have been trying to figure out how to get around here and how to get safely on their journey. Of course, on a great modern ship like this, we just go willy-nilly wherever we want. But uh, uh, this is a very um, dynamic um, place in the world for navigation, though it's not constricted by land as much as, let's say, Cape Horn. And when we were on the way down to Cape Town, we were in Namibia, and we had this very cold water coming up from the Southern Ocean that created incredible fog. And so every day we'd come out, and it would be cold and foggy. And then by midday, it all burnt off, and the um, hot desert could be felt. When you come down to Cape Town, it's very mild and pleasant because it's sort of in a shelter of where it's, the water isn't that cold and it isn't that hot. And... It's a sort of almost a Mediterranean climate. Now, as we go up the coast, though, we're going to be getting warmer and more humid all the way to Mozambique and getting into the tropical Indian waters. And another day, I'll talk just about the Indian Ocean. But in this area where we are is uh, characterized by the collision of the currents and the sharp te temperature differences, which then create uh, very big standing waves, probably the biggest on average around the world other than a stormy North Atlantic, North Pacific. But they will be wind against current, which makes a, a very big chop. And then occasionally it spins up into large rogue waves. And so ships down here are always on notice for uh, reports of extra big seas. And they can go waves up to 100 to 200 feet high. And so this is uh, the terror of the seas down here. Not this time of year. This is in the southern winter. Not on Christmas Day, of course. <clears throat> but this is what can happen down here in these seas at that time of year. And many ships, uh, the, there are about 15 major ships lost a year down here. Uh, mainly large tankers because they will trough out. They say the waves get so big the center of the ship will be have... Uh, no water under the ship will break and go down suddenly. And then these will also break on land. Now, this is uh, unbelievable that waves get this big, but that's what happens down here. Now they have monitors or, or uh, geostatic 
uh, satellites that can measure the waves as they go by and then put out a warning. So these big rogue waves will be sweeping across the southern ocean, particularly around the Cape down here, and then they'll send out a, a warning to the ships that there'll be one of them, and the, the sailing instructions are to take it um, about 15 degrees off the bow so you don't pitch up and slam down, you ride over it, hopefully. But this is one of the big tankers they call Cape Wise because they're the biggest in the world come around here. But they are more dangerous than a smaller ship like this which can ride, maybe be uncomfortable, but will not have the same structural problems as a big empty tanker. So South Africa has its share of shipwrecks, including ones that wash up every year in the winter on the shore here. But not us, we're on schedule. Right? We wouldn't want to miss tea time just because of a silly rogue wave. The other thing you may have seen out here is uh, a lot of oil rigs. Um, all the way from Angola down to here, we have been passing one rig after the other. So this is one of the new areas for exp exploration. Just in February, they, they um, approved uh, drilling out here to, to, to test and see the uh, off, just off the continental shelf whether there will be gas resources for South Africa, which doesn't have its own energy supply. So just day before yesterday, out of Cape Town, we were passing one of these rigs, and I took this picture off the ship here. And I don't know if anybody's in the oil business, but that doesn't look like a safe place to spend a holiday. Um, but that's the, the industry now. Of course, the price of oil is dropping, so a lot of this exploration is suddenly being put on hold because there's an oversupply. But that's another topic. Meanwhile, the sea down here, particularly in the winter, gets so rough that that's I can't imagine they're putting out rigs out in it because of the the rogue waves and then just the regular pounding against the shore. This is uh, the c famous Cathedral Rock, which is just up the coast from where we are. Though we're not getting anywhere near it like this to take a look at it, but this coast is constantly being eroded in the winter. But undersea is full of life. There is a um, upwellings of minerals and then um, mixing of waters different salinities, different temperatures. But what this does, it creates tremendous um, marine life, especially famous are the, the sardine blooms, where there's vast schools of, um, schools of, of sardines that come um, in March and April, and then they bring lots of sharks and lots of predators in. So there's, and there's so many that people just wade out into the ocean with a basket and pick them up because they'll be driven ashore by the predators. This is a sort of a seasonal phenomena, though. It's w also one reason why there are great whites here. Be between the sardines, the penguins, and the seals, there's plenty for them to eat. And uh, this is a... Uh, you don't want to get close to these guys because they didn't brush their teeth. But uh, it's a f sort of a frenzy in the water right near where we're going, off of Durban up to Mozambique. That's the richest of these feeding grounds in the seasonal... Uh, migration, particularly of the sardines. And then we have porpoises and whales and all kinds of sightings. You can sit on, seasonally on the shore in this part of South Africa, see quite a bit of the uh, dolphins and the whales. And of course we passed some of the islands where they had a lot of kelp and um, c colonies of, of the fur seals. Well here are the sardines of various species and sizes, but that's one of the great harvests of this ocean here. And then down below, there's a lot of unusual um, creatures, let's say. Um, and the deeper you go, they get bigger. This is a kind of a gigantic, uh, almost like a bug, but the isopod. And um, in the depths of the Southern Ocean, there's quite a bit of unusual uh, uh, marine life. I'll show someone another day when I talk more about the tropical Indian waters where we're going, which is a great goal for divers. These are sea urchins in a kelp, in a kelp bed offshore here. And they're full of creatures, large and small, octopus, rock lobsters. Here's a curious one, the puffer, puffer adder shy shark. There are quite a few varieties of sharks that are endemic in these waters that are found nowhere else in the world. And then the great whites are the top predator and uh, still caught for sport, though I think they may get around to banning uh, catching of any of them, even though they're very, very dangerous. The basis of all this marine life, though, are the krill, the vast uh, schools, again, of millions and billions of these tiny shrimp that only grow three, four centimeters long. Uh, but that's the primary food for many of the whales, and particularly that come feeding from Antarctica, um, 
come up here to, to uh, mate and calve in, in False Bay near Cape Town and other waters right around here is where they will come to feed on a lot of the plankton, all the, th the different life. And uh, then um, here's an ice fish, which is a curious one that is in the waters here. It's just called ice because it's completely transparent. And then there are the, the very squids and um, cephalopods, all kinds of creatures, including giant squid. And off of here again, the, the uh, sperm whale will come to hunt giant squids right off of here. And uh, so now I'm going to go take you a little further afield around the Southern Ocean. Uh, there are quite a few French islands uh, as a legacy from explorers who are looking for particularly uh, whaling stations or coal stations, and so the French overseas territories include the uh, Kerguelen uh, Archipelago, which is out right to the southeast of where we are, really in the middle of the Southern Ocean, though some people call it in the Indian Ocean, but it's really all the same here. Uh, but this is a very lonely outpost, and at the top of a, a seamount volcano that is slowly being eroded away. There are many others that have been perhaps above water in in the millions of years, but they've eroded, so there's only a handful of these islands in this entire stretch of the Southern Ocean. And there's a French Navy base there, um, some science, but, uh, scientists that have a station, but nobody lives there because it's completely cold and windswept all year round. Um, nonetheless, uh, whalers and sealers went there to hunt. Um, and so since 1811, there have been people there and it's been a French territory. The other thing is they had a lot of shipwrecks on there because on the clipper trade, they'd be going sweeping along, thinking there's no land for a thousand miles, and they'd bump into this. So there were a lot of shipwrecks, and uh, some of the sailors had to live off the uh, bird eggs or eat penguins, and so there's a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, marooned and stranded sailors down here. But one thing they did find is this called a Kerugland uh, um, cabbage, which is an edible, uh, big leafy plant, but that's the only plant of any size on otherwise a barren island. Now, maybe some of you have actually gone here if uh, you're on one of the expedition ships to Antarctica, but um, it's very barren. There's only this one kind of moss with the only other plant on the whole island. Uh, but then there are these uh, manganese no uh, nodules that are on the islands and in the sea nearby. So there's a possibility this will be a, a major mining area if um, it becomes economically viable. But you can see the vastness of this ocean. Uh, there's a couple of other little islands, Croset Island and a few others, but mainly you, you end up getting sweeping around through the vast ocean. This is really uh, tremendous. It's, um, if you want to sail all the way around it, it's um, over 18,000 sea miles right here. And then you run into a few other little way station islands. Again, French, the Ile de Croset. And again, they're sea mounts of volcanoes. And uh, they're not active now, but uh, uh, it's curious how in the middle of the ocean you'll have these tremendous peaks pop up. It's sort of like the Canary Islands or uh, we were in Cabo Verde. And again, this is a volcanism that's coming up from the sea, breaching and then slowly getting eroded. And then life takes hold in these places, all the king penguins. And I imagine most of you have been to Antarctica, which is the other side of the Southern Ocean and all of the life that's down there. Uh, but just continuing around the world on the Southern Ocean, you have to pass uh, Cape Lewin in Australia, uh, Tasmania, that's the first full chart of Australia. And of course, uh, the great vast interior of Australia was not known, but the coast became known by sailors. And uh, this is the first in Western Australia, the point of land that is, marks the, uh, the entering the Bight of Australia. And again, uh, sailors will look for that light and know where they are because they have to stay south of that to get around the, uh, the great continent there and then go on to New Zealand and continue on to Cape Horn. The most southern of all the Australian islands is uh, Macquarie Island, which is essentially down south near the uh, uh, southern island of New Zealand. But how about that for snow in Australia? Again, it's just a scientific station. It's a stopping waypoint for researchers to go to Antarctica. Now, there it is. That's uh, Macquarie Island down the f lower left side. And then you have uh, Campbell Island, which is the most southern of the New Zealand islands. 
and again, a kind of a barren island. It's not that far from South Island, but this is again those in the in the weather there is this constant wind and cold seas, and some of the uh, life on the island is merely tussock grasses and birds, lots of birds. So this is a feature of all of this part of the world. There are, in, even though it's very rough. Um, weather often, the birds seem to thrive down here because of so much fish to eat. So then you continue all the way across the Pacific Ocean, you end up in this uh, great piece of land. I'm sure you've all passed around Cape Horn, the Straits of Magellan. Uh, this is a, a very dramatic uh, part of the world also, and Cape Horn is down the tip of off the uh, archipelago of Tierra del Fuego. Though for safety, most ships will go through the Straits of Magellan because you want to avoid the great Cape Horn, which is that ragged, they call it the ragged face of the devil when it, whenever it was sighted. But again, in the summertime, at least in this time of year, if you're there, it's often calm. But in the winter, it roars and has standing tremendous big waves, uh, 50 feet high up our course, and then howling gales constantly. So this was the, sailors call this the Mount Everest of, of the sea, because to get around it was often so hazardous that uh, it's estimated a thousand ships have sunk right off there and there are about 10,000 casualties right off those rocks essentially because they could not sight the stars in the, in the bad weather they had only a, a dead reckoning to see where they were and they often came to demise on those rocks that was a major trade route though before the Panama Canal to get from the Pacific back to the Atlantic back to Europe and so Every day, ships would try to pass it. It often took up to a month just to get around the points of it. And, of course, now it's gone down. Just it, People just go there for pleasure, mostly. Not that much trade down there. But the first to sight Cape Horn was Sir Francis Drake. He did not want to get through the Straits of Magellan because the Spanish would attack him. So he went down and out and got blown back and down south in the storms and on a ship, the Golden Hind. So he was the first one to make a note that there was a large sea below Tierra del Fuego and that's why the passage is named after him, the Drake Passage. And that's about 700 sea miles till you get down to the South Shetland Islands and the Antarctic Peninsula. Again, maybe you've taken that trip. It can be very uncomfortable to say the least. It's so rough though because it has the highest volume of water in the world going through the most narrow channels with these ridges and um, cliffs and depths, so it is estimated that it's 175 sverups, and that's a, uh, an oceanographic measure for a million gallons a second passing there. So that passage has as much water going through it every second, more than all of the rivers in the world. And that it has tremendous uh, subsea um, pressures in there because the whole southern ocean and the, and the transpolar Antarctic uh, current goes squeezing through what is essentially a, 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 a trench that's pinched by the Antarctic Peninsula and then the tip of South America. That's why it's so rough. It almost looks like the land itself has been swept to the east by all of the strong uh, seas. But that's, a, that's just the way it looks. It's actually the, the, the chain of the Andes essentially continued all the way down to Antarctica and as they pulled away they left this trench. Um, but it's very, very rough waters, more than we'll have right here, at least this time of year. Then there are these other islands that are, again, volcanic ridges being all the way to the uh, uh, South Orkney and South Sandwich Island. Again, these are rocks with uh, only birds on them. This is the great hazard of the Drake Passage of the Diego Ramirez Islands, which are f further south and uh, west of Cape Horn. But again, sailors would not know quite where they were, and again, they just collected shipwrecks like uh, a hobby. I was once on a ship that was grounded there. And they are uh, raggedy volcanic spikes, essentially, uh, and very hard to see in bad weather. Another thing that they do in the, um, especially in the winter when there's a deep, thick cloud cover, this is called the Carmen Vortex, which is a, a hydraulic phenomena of a, a standing object will then have a current or either wind or air go by it and then it creates these whirls which uh, can be uh, quite dangerous if you're a sail ship but uh, in the ocean these islands create that effect this vortex where you can from now from space we watch them go past these islands that create uh, the uh, the effect of the vortex in the cloud cover 
here's a very big one. This is actually off of Korea in a, in a Siberian storm, not where we are, but you can see the pattern there between the typhoon and the landmass. And again, uh, the, the amount of life on these little rocks and islands is quite remarkable. Mainly the birds that we can see are the penguins or the seals. These are uh, royal albatross. They're mainly nesting, and then, of course, then they go out to feed in the waters. But uh, perhaps you've seen these down in these places, the, the great albatrosses, which are almost the symbol of the Southern Ocean. And, of course, for years, uh, they would hover over sail ships. And it was considered very bad luck to shoot one uh, or try to catch one. It would doom the ship. So, uh, and even in the roughest weather, they are seen placidly f gliding over the whole thing. As a, and it's said that they're the... Uh, sailors who die at sea become an albatross in their next life just to keep an eye on their mates. So here's the sooty albatross. If you go down to Cape Horn, this is the monument to all the sailors that have been lost off in the Drake Passage. And it's actually uh, two pieces of metal. So as you walk around it, it animates the image of the bird. And there are many. The shags, uh, petrels, um, Arctic terns, I don't want to put them all in my view here, but of course the favorite is all the different kinds of penguins, which are endemic all around the Southern Ocean. They come up to Brazil, I mean, sorry, to South America, Africa, Australia, New Zealand, and uh, they are our, our best friend, though I always, when I'm with kids and I say, well, penguins don't really talk, don't believe the, the, in the movie, but they can dance. Then there are all the seals, especially the great elephant seal, the great bulls bellowing at each other. And if you've ever seen those live, you'll never forget the odor. And then in the sea, there's vast riches in the Southern Ocean, all the different dolphins and whales, um, killer whales, which uh, prey up on the seals. There are killer whales all over the world. They're the most widespread of all of the um, orca it's the proper name nowadays, but uh, they are hunting in groups and are very social, but they travel all over the world in their, in their lifestyle. Where we are now, there's the, the, the uh, bride's whale, and it's a mid-sized whale about between a say and a fin-sized whale, up to uh, 20 meters long, not as big as the great blue whales that again are um, migratory. These actually stay in the bays and are year-round off of South Africa. And they used to have whaling stations. This is actually, the name comes from a Norwegian whaler who set up a station down off, off the South African coast. But these again are coming and staying here to feed on the rich uh, plankton and small bait fish. Um, but if I was swimming, I would want to not get too close to that. Uh, they, they're not tooth whales, they're balen feeders, so they, they gobble up and strain and live off the small fry. Well, then I'm going to go on just to s Antarctica, because that's the, the bottom of the world and that's the fantastic place. Again, I imagine many of you have been there, and it's only in the last century that we got it at all. Now, the first explorers went down there a few hundred years ago and ran into the ice and did not land. Um, now we know the ex extent of it, and there are some 23 research stations. And the Antarctic Convention, though, prevents any um, either mining or uh, territorial claims or any military there. So it's a, it's a special place on our planet. When Captain Cook came on his uh, second voyage, he came down into the ice, and he did not sight land, though. Um, there was a Captain Palmer, who was an American sealer, who was the first one to actually land on the Antarctic Peninsula. But again, they came down into this fantastic world of ice, and it was so hazardous for these sail ships. Of course, many, many were lost. Uh, this is uh, James Weddell, 1823, came into the Weddell Sea, named after him. And that, that sea has a gyre that tends to trap ships, like Shackleton. Um, other Navy and other commercial ships came down through the... 1800s to try to survey it, but the place is so vast that much of the coast of Antarctica is, is still unsounded um, to make a, d a detailed uh, measure of the, uh, particularly under the ice cap. So this is Shackleton's ship, the Endeavour, that got caught in the Weddell Sea and then crushed and sank. A few years ago, I was on the great German ship, the Hanseatic. We went down and retraced that voyage, and in the same place, we got trapped in the ice, but pushed our way out, fortunately. 
and we followed the whole journey. Unbelievable that they got a, a, just loaded their ship and then walked all the way back to eventually rescue. But it, since um, scientific stations have been down there, it's been very difficult to uh, keep them open from all this ice that accumulates seasonally. Here's uh, on the Ross Sea and the, where the McMurdo Sound scientific station is, and they had to bring in the Navy to push the bergs away, the tabular bergs, these are called, to get into the land, be able to supply the station. Of course, now most of it comes down just flying. But these great ice shelf, this is of great study because if, if the, the great uh, shells, especially the Ross Sea shelf, breaks off more and drops into the sea and floats out, it'll dramatically raise sea levels around the world. So the, there's a lot of study of how the ice packs in, how it gets caught on the continental shelf of the rocks that are very deep below the sea level, and then they break off. Uh, you can see that name, the uh, Polinia. That's a Russian term for a open water surrounded by ice, and very dangerous because the sea ice, again, depending on the weather and the wind, will come in and pack in. Uh, so its navigation down there is particularly challenging, and uh, but it's also very beautiful. It's, one of those, it's like the great living um, sculpture gallery down there with all the weathered ice everywhere. In the last number of years, this is 2010, there have been tremendous pieces breaking off. Uh, these are the size of, um, oh, many, many kilometers long and wide and also very deep in the ocean because only one-sixth of the ice is above surface. So this is tremendous re reservoir of freshwater ice. And then as they break off, they send all the smaller uh, icebergs out, making it very difficult for supplies or getting into places. So that's why uh, there's a mention, uh, at least in the Antarctic Convention, they were debating whether or not to ban all uh, cruise ships from going down there that are not rated for the ice. And uh, the ones that go on expedition ships are rated so they can get out when the ice catches them. They're not really breaking their way through big ice, but um, even small supply ships often run aground or else are pushed in. We once down had to rescue people from an Argentine ship going to the Argentine station, and that ship went down in Palmer Bay, and it's still down at about 2,000 feet and still, still leaking oil to this day, and that was now 20 years ago. So it's very dangerous. This is my old ship. I, the first one I worked on, the Lindblad Explorer, which for 30 years was going around uh, Antarctica and then the Arctic uh, uh, since 1965. It was the first expedition ship to go down there and very lonely down there at that time. There were no other uh, ships other than research vessels. Uh, and then in 2007, that, uh, under a different owner, ran on some ice off of South Georgia Island and sank in uh, 6,000 feet down. So that's one of the first expedition ships that met its end down there. But meanwhile, life goes on, and it's a fantastic place if you haven't been to Antarctica. I recommend it because of just the visual qualities of quite, quite dramatic. And it's in the austral summer, it's not that cold. In the winter, of course, it's dark all the time, and uh, it's very, very dangerous. But I just took these pictures there a few years ago to, just to uh, show how dramatic the ice can be, though, again, it's very dangerous. You have to be very careful around. You can see the underwater portions because you can come up and either the waves or just the, the action will either push you onto the ice or else the ice will fall on top of you. So Antarctica is really the big question down here because the climatic changes in Antarctica will have a great effect on the, the rest of the planet, especially South America, Australia, and, and South Africa. Because what is the territorial, let's say, seas of, uh, of Antarctica have had many changes in recent years. Now, this is the ozone hole, which has been growing and then shrinking and um, a matter of international convention. And so when there was a, a scientific uh, reports about the, that the um, uh, CFC uh, f uh, carbofluorides were burning the ozone layer and creating intense radiation in, in Antarctica. That was the first convention that banned those chemicals that were used for aerosol sprays and other industrial uses. That agreement to um, change the chemical uses, including halon for fire extinguishers on ships, uh, to have 
other agents that will not deplete the ozone. Now the ozone hole has been shrinking, but nonetheless, whenever you go down there, and even in the southern tip of Patagonia, if you go out without a hat, you risk very serious sunstroke. And so hopefully that will close up and be, be a problem of the climate that we may have caused and we have hopefully solved. Uh, this is a compl complex chemistry of where oxygen has extra radical and then it, in the upper atmosphere it shields the atmosphere from radiation from the sun, but of course on ground level it is somewhat toxic as in smog. But it's been going up and down for quite a while, and so everybody's watching to see whether it's going to be higher or lower in the seasonal um, transition in Antarctica. The other, the other issue that has been watching carefully is the convergence. This yellow line is where the cold waters meet the warmer waters to the north, and that line has been moving seasonally and over centuries, certainly. But in, just in this century, it's been measured that it's shrinking down toward Antarctica. So the convergence was right off where we are now in South Africa. And then, of course, it gets pinched in the currents of South America. And then the Bight of, of Australia has traditionally had colder water. Now it's getting warmer. And the current line is that yellow one that uh, the world is getting warmer, especially the seas are getting warmer. Maybe our home is not that much, but this changing of the Southern Ocean is a... Uh, uh, like the Arctic is sort of the canary in the mind for the question of what the future climate will be. So these currents that are flowing around the gyres that go into the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean are often driven by what the, uh, the Antarctic circumpolar current is doing. And uh, so that if it gets warmer in Antarctica, it'll certainly get warmer everywhere else. You see here there's some gyres in the seas of the Ross Sea and the Weddell and these are the things that are being studied now to say, what do they do to affect the, the polar, or rather the circumnavigating uh, current, and then <coughs> affect the, the northern world. So this is very complicated. It's also very large, so it's hard to do any of this research without ships in many places taking readings like the one I work on, or else uh, satellite uh, measurements or the other way to keep an eye on what's going on down there. But just under the ocean, the, the currents are very complicated because you have uh, deep water coming from the North Atlantic, like I first mentioned, coming all the way down to Antarctica, then coming up and then joining the surface currents that are going around the continent. And so there's a great deal of un, uh, mystery of how these things work, particularly you see in the deep here, the, the bottom water. Those are areas of tremendous depth, tremendous pressure, and um, they have a lot of mineral content. Those get stirred up and then they come up to higher waters, and that's what is often gives uh, plankton blooms and variety of marine life. The other thing that's been found recently is that there's a temperature transition. About every eight years, there's a wave that passes all the way around Antarctica, and uh, it's called the circumpolar wave, which is essentially hot water and warmer air that, that moves around Antarctica on a... On a uh, circular pattern, and it is related also to El Nino effect in the Pacific and other effects in the South Atlantic. But this is something that is, again, a, a, a planetary phenomena that before we could sense it uh, or get, get, a, get a, some data on it, we didn't know that it even existed. So there's um, every year the warm water, which also picks up an elevation slightly, so it's sort of a big bulge that goes all the way around the Southern Ocean and it spins around about on an eight-year cycle. And um, I like this illustration because it makes it look like some sort of oceanographic psychedelia. And <laughs> but that's the, 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 the research that's going on now to find out why all this happens and how it may change in the future or, or at least we can understand our planet and this great ocean. So I was just there the other day, if you were at Cape Hope uh, and Cape Point, and it's such a dramatic place. Uh, very remarkable tip of Africa. Uh, this is not what we are going to see up, going up the uh, east coast of South Africa, but this particular place is especially beautiful, and you could feel the power of the ocean pounding uh, these great waves, a bunch of seals out there. I don't know if you saw this area. This is right at Cape Hope and the uh, marker there, but uh, the swells coming from the Southern Ocean, this is where they first start hitting the continent of Africa and again, it creates a lot of marine life. 
and I saw this off in the distance, which uh, looked like some sort of a volcanic eruption. Well, what it was, it was a, a, re a rock and just off the shore. And that's the uh, Regent Voyager back there. So you can see this, uh, the size of this uh, disturbance in the water. Now, it's on marked on the nautical charts. Don't get there because even if it looks like it's just a bit of foam, there's a big rock right under That's why it's making this uh, dramatic um, sight. And there was all kinds of birds around there because it's also throwing up all kinds of fish from the depths. And so it's one of these oceanic phenomena that uh, uh, I had to show you just because this is the living ocean uh, as we can see it on this cruise itself. So I hope you enjoy this ocean and you have a few ideas about it now that you may never knew about before. But I'll, I, I, this is a picture I just took the other day also near that oil rig. So we have particularly beautiful weather to go along with our Christmas spirit here. And I'll leave you with one last saying of my colleague uh, Jean-Michel Cousteau. You protect that which you love. And may the ocean be our friend. Thank you very much and have a great trip and a happy holidays.